Hey, so I'm here. Excellent. <laughs> right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, everybody, welcome to the first of the SLF co uh, Fringe events at this conference. As an initial plug, the other one is on Saturday at 4.35 and is with its cable. Tonight, though, we're talking about radical tradition and liberalism, leading the debate then and now. My name is Chris Wilmore, and I'm chair of this event. And Andy Galloway is my assistant, and we'll take over if I foul up completely. And we have two speakers. Now, those of you who were involved in September will remember how jinxed the event was, and tonight's has been rather jinxed. But we think we are now ready to roll. <coughs> now. Let me start by explaining. What we're going to do is to look at the 20th century, and we're going to look at events leading up to Beveridge, and then after Beveridge, to look at radical liberalism and how it's managed to influence and shape the debate, not just as a historic exercise, but in order to draw some lessons about where we are now and where we go. Our two speakers, um, dealing with the period up to Beveridge, if you like, we've got Michael Meadow. And Michael, as you know, is a former Liberal MP. He joined the party before I was born. Um, he's held a host of <laughs> other roles, including chairing the Electoral Reform Society, and he's worked all over the world on democratic development. Um, but of course, he's best known as a jazz musician, most famously in Granny Lee's All Stars. And Dr. Matt Cole. Um, has examined the ideas and fortunes of post-war British liberalism as a doctoral student, has authored several books and articles, including Richard Wainwright's biography. And he worked in the General Election Union for the SDP in 1987 at the same time as I was part of the group writing the liberal bit of the manifesto. Um, and since 1992, he's been a BBC political analyst as well as lecturing um, at the Open University, University of Birmingham and other places. So welcome to both of you. What we're going to do is take 15 minutes or so for each of them. Michael's going to speak first and then, then Matt. And then if you want to type questions into the Q&A bit of the site, we'll call questions afterwards. So we should have lots of time for questions. Michael, do you want to start? Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate what you say about the jazz side. I arrived on a train from King's Cross one time into Leeds and I got into a taxi. The taxi driver looked at me and he said, I know you. And I thought, oh, I've been recognised. He said, you're that clarinetist. So I thought that's the end of my political career, isn't it? Anyway, look, some of you who have been in liberal politics for enough years may well be aware that, that since 1968 I've written and spoken almost incessantly on liberal philosophy and values as being the crucial foundation for policy. Any of you can check it if you ever wanted to on my website in the archive. However, I've been more tolerant than might be thought on the tailoring of those values to different circumstances and times. My 25 years assisting electoral politics in 35 new and emerging countries has certainly informed that tolerance. For instance, liberals in countries where clericalism was dominant, such as, uh, as Spain, Belgium, Latin America, have to evolve a liberalism that counters that. Liberals in a country such as France, where Republican values have a different focus, then its liberals are involved with secularism and the separation of the state from all church. So it is with different eras. 20th century British liberals dealing with the rise of labor the decline of class dominance and an awareness of unsupportable employment and social conditions have different giants to slay than we have today. We need to be tolerant. Politics is extremely complicated and it is an art, not a science. As Keynes said, we have to invent a new wisdom for a new age. The Liberal Party in 1924, in 1951 and arguably in 1970 faced existential crises which threatened its survival. Now, the Liberal Democrats today are facing such an existential crisis. The differences are, first, that today the party is not aware of the crisis, and second, it's not capable of expressing and expounding a distinctive and persuasive vision of the society it seeks. Today, the party is virtually dead. It languishes at 6% in the polls, 
And this month, two highly reputable polling agencies put the Greens above the Liberal Democrats. A majority of constituencies have no viable party association, but the party nationally has a superb structure with federal and national committees, subcommittees, panels and associated bodies dedicated to what? To maintaining that structure. Meanwhile, outside its ghetto, the party is ignored and irrelevant. What a shameful state of affairs for liberalism, once said to be the noblest appeal ever to be heard on this planet. So that's the now of our title today. What are the then? The crucial difference was that despite the naivety of Herbert Gladstone with the 1903 Lib Lab Pact, despite the apostasy of Lloyd George in 1918, despite the seduction of John Simon by the Conservatives in 1930, there were those in the Liberal Party who knew what they believed, why they believed it, and saw the need to ensure, at whatever personal cost, that there was the political party organised and prepared to espouse those beliefs and to present them to the electorate. In terms of leadership, there was a small band of Liberals, including Campbell Bannerman briefly, Donald Maclean, Archie Sinclair, Graham White, whom I knew well, Ernest Simon until 1945, Clement Davis after 94, and you can name others, no doubt. Matt will deal with the post-1945 situation. But above all these people was one man whose sacrificial personal dedication kept the party going and ideologically sound. That man was Ramsey Muir, a name not particularly well known, but he had a prolific output of writing. He had a commitment to the role of chair of the party's executive, for which incidentally he resigned his chair of modern history to actually do it full time. And above all, he had a clear focus on the unique, unique nature of liberalism. It was Ramsey Muir who drafted the superb preamble to the Constitution when the party was reorganised in 1936. His accomplice in this was Elliot Dodds, also I knew. And I'm sure that as a distinguished journalist, it was Elliot who put it into such beautiful English. But now the party, in effect liberalism, relies on writers such as Ian Dunn, Tim Garton Ash and Nick Barlow to express liberalism rather than party activists. Muir's message to the party in 1923 can be applied today. He said, I believe we have thought too much about leaders and organisation and inquired too little. This has been the malady of the Liberal Party for a long time. But I turn now to the policy areas we are asked particularly to consider today poverty and unemployment. Interestingly, and perhaps perversely, three names are linked together throughout the attempts to counter poverty and unemployment. Those three are Lloyd George, Maynard Keynes and William Beveridge. The three knew each other and they worked cooperatively. Before Lloyd George as Chancellor in the 1906 Liberal Government and his 1909 budget, there were no state pensions. There were a few friendly societies into which individuals could contribute for their old age and there were even fewer companies that made any provision. But Lloyd George believed that the state had a responsibility for its elderly, and he included a provision in his budget for that. He was determined that the rich should bear the main burden. Now, it's sometimes said that he designed the budget as a challenge to the House of Lords, but actually there's no evidence for this. Certainly Lloyd George, and even more so Asquith, never thought that the Lords would break the 250-year-old constitutional convention which made finance the concern totally of the commons, but they did break it. Interestingly, Lloyd George's main ally in campaigning for this radical budget was Winston Churchill. Lloyd George increased the level of taxation of a number of headings, but the main and certainly the most controversial innovation was the introduction of land value taxation. This has been liberal policy since 1893, but we now forget about that, you see. Innovation in the budget was the introduction of land value taxation. In terms of its imposition in the budget, it was at a relatively modest level. But of course, the point was that it necessitated a valuation across the country, which could be used for increasing the rate of tax in the future. Incidentally, much later in 1944, discussing beverage, Churchill commented, the prime parent of all national insurance schemes is, of course, Lloyd George. An emasculated budget finally passed into law and on the 1st of January 1909 old age pensions were introduced at a maximum of five shillings, 25p a week for those aged 70 and over. Now remember at this time the expectation of life was 40 and 43 years for male and females respectively. 
It's rather like getting your pension today at the age of 90. However, the expectation of life at the age of 70 was a further nine years, around about half the expected extra years at age 67 today. Hence the vast cost of pensions. I note incidentally that we still have this triple lock on pensions, which Steve Webb introduced. Steve Webb was the only MP, I think, who understood pensions in the whole of the House of Commons. And in fact, the triple lock will put pensions above national average wage soon because it's bound to keep on um, ratcheting up. Labour exchanges to counter unemployment were also introduced in 1909. The minister responsible was Winston Churchill. And they, incidentally, were based on research work that was done by the young William Beveridge. Lloyd George continued his social reforms by financing the whole series of reports with different coloured covers leading up to the 1929 general election. The most famous, of course, is his Yellow Book of Keynesian solutions to the huge unemployment crisis, paraphrased for the election as we can conquer unemployment. Alas, a coalition Labour government was elected which eventually became the national government and the Yellow Book was never enacted in this country. It was partially implemented by Franklin Roosevelt in the USA. Roosevelt's personal copy of the Yellow Book with Franklin Roosevelt's marginal annotation in his own hand is there in the Library of Congress in America. It's worth noting incidentally, for not least for liberalism today, that the key paragraph from the Yellow Book was not directly to do with methods of conquering unemployment. And it said, the measures we advocate for all these things spring from one clear purpose. We believe with a passionate faith that the end of all political and economic action is not the perfecting of this or that piece of mechanism or organization, but that individual men and women may have life and that they have it more abundantly. The mechanisms were only a means to an end. Maynard Keynes was involved with national finance from an early date and his famous condemnation of the post First World War Versailles settlement was, was that book, The Economic Consequences of the War. And his belief that it was a disastrous settlement proved all too accurate in the rise of Nazism in Germany. Keynes was much more politically important than is often realized. He was remarkably self-confident in his views and even more remarkably was almost invariably proved right not least in the implementation of what we now know as Keynesianism, which was completely counterindicative at the time and is little understood even today. At the Bretton Woods Conference of July 1944, Keynes was very ill, but such was his importance to the discussions that day after day, he was virtually dragged from his sickbed to deal with those who opposed this and what was the United Kingdom's policy. So Keynes was all his life a, a, a liberal, he, he queried his own liberalism on a number of occasions, but he kept on making donations. And of course, his wife was a very active liberal and spoke on platforms. At the time that Beveridge was working on his report, Keynes was the giant of economic policy and his approval was crucial to Beveridge. He and Keynes knew each other from participation in liberal summer schools. So Beveridge consulted Keynes and received a letter from Keynes, which said, let me say, I have read your memorandum, which leaves me in a state of wild enthusiasm for your general scheme. I think it is a vast constructive reform of real importance, and I'm relieved to find that it is so financially possible. Keynes did, however, get an undertaking from Beveridge that the cost of the Exchequer would be limited to £100 million. Beveridge summed up the object of his report. The main feature of my plan for Social Security is a unified, comprehensive scheme of social insurance to be administered by one department to provide cash benefits equal in amount and in time without a means test at a flat rate of benefit in return for a flat rate of contributions. With this goes a comprehensive health scheme and a system of children's allowances. The birth and initial development of his report is politically fascinating. He was first approached in 1942 by Uni Bevin and he was told that the committee should be essentially official in character dealing with administrative issues rather than issues of policy. Bedford was having none of that, and from the beginning set out an agenda that was clearly concerned with policy. This caused problems in that the members of his committee were all senior civil servants representing each of the government departments, and they clearly could not commit their political masters. The minister responsible for the committee in Parliament was Arthur Greenwood, and he resolved this by making all the members purely advisory 
which is the reason that only Beveridge's signature appears on the report. Neither he, neither Beveridge nor the committee members were bothered by the change of status. They all continued as before, but now with political cover. Beveridge also consulted and gained the support of Lloyd George. And it is interesting that, the, in fact, Lloyd George's last ever vote in the House of Commons was for the Beveridge report. Despite the support of Keynes and Lloyd George's parliamentary support for the report, it was not overwhelmingly supported in Parliament by the other parties, but it did eventually gain enough cross-party support to gain widespread political approval. The first party to welcome the Beveridge report without reservation was the Liberal Party, and this was the key factor in persuading him to join the party and to become MP for Berwick. Alas, he lost his seat in the 1945 election debacle, partly through neglecting his own campaign to tour the country speaking for other candidates. He later became a Liberal member of the House of Lords. And I leave it to Matt to take the story on, and I finish this section by noting Beveridge's comment when he said that looking at the Liberal manifesto for the 1923 election, that we would have had social insurance 20 years earlier had more people voted Liberal at the 1923 election. Thank you very much. That's now for Matt to take the story forward. Thank you, uh, Michael, and, and uh, a, a, a very uh, full and uh, sort of, uh, a full insight into radicalism in the Liberal Party and the Liberal Party's radical contribution uh, between the wars and in the first part of the 20th century, and, and one that illustrates how important individuals and their ideas are to this in taking things forward. Um, what I want to focus on here uh, is, as, as Michael uh, started by saying, uh, it's the conditions in which those ideas can gain most uh, purchase and most prospect to being put into, into practice. Um, and I want to look at the, the second half of the 20th century, the early 21st century, as an illustration of that. It, it's a bit uh, it's a bit odd to talk about radical liberalism because it's a tautology. Uh, liberalism is by its nature radical and uh, it, it requires change. It requires liberation. It requires the promotion of individual choice and interest and uh, uh, and uh, uh, development. Uh, those are the themes that come out in the party's um, uh, mission statement written by Ramsey Muir and, and still essentially the, the core of the, the, uh, the party's um, mission statement today. Um, radicalism is a, is a term that was used by uh, the, the earliest 19th century liberals. Uh, it, it was the radical group was um, actually the the smallest of the three which formed the Liberal Party in 1859. Uh, people like John Bright and John Stuart Mill um, were uh, uh, were uh, dis described by the the historian of the early stages of the Liberal Party, John Vincent, as as, as crotchety, uh, crotchety independent figures, people who uh, themselves had a variety of different. Um, uh, agendas and, and priorities. Some believed in enfranchising women, some didn't. Uh, the term radicalism was taken up and used by by uh, a number of uh, constituency associations. It is still used in some, uh, including Rochdale, for example, uh, as, as a description of what liberalism is. So it, it couldn't not be part of the liberal story, even at the Liberal Party's darkest hours, which parts of the, the uh, post-war period included. Interestingly, in 1945, um, at that point where Beveridge lost his seat, um, uh, ironically, after Churchill had said um, during the campaign, uh, wh whoever is the victor in this election, uh, undoubtedly Mr. Beveridge has won it. Um, he ironically lost his seat, but he was the best recognised liberal uh, amongst the public in Gallup polls. Uh, now, to be fair, it was only 8% of people, but it, it meant that uh, he was at least in some way associated with the Liberal Party. The Liberal Party was associated with the ideas of state intervention to tackle poverty, inequality and lack of opportunity. And, um, it, you know, that's reflected in the Liberal Assembly uh, just prior to the election, at which only four uh, delegates uh, voted against the beverage report. Uh, for people who were described even by Violet Bonham Carter as bow and arrow men. Um, things have moved on 
Uh, in other words, even for those people who had in the past been sceptical about using the state or, or, or local authorities as an instrument for um, dealing with inequality. Uh, and, and even the Labour Party, and I'd be careful and quote them accurately here, prepared in 1945 a briefing for the, the, an internal confidential briefing for their own candidates and, and canvassers that, that looked at the Liberal Party and, and thought about its significance and said uh, there is no doubt that there has been, uh, sorry, uh, said that uh, the Liberals' policy draws heavily on Labour's economic policy. For example, the Liberals propose uh, nationalisation of mines, control of monopolies, um, expanding public expenditure. Uh, Liberals ask the question, uh, ask the electorate to believe that unlike Labour's policy, this is quite different from socialism. There is no, this, I presume there was no intended pun here, there is no radical difference between the programmes. Um, in other words, the, the Labour Party thought that the Liberals were uh, actually, they shared a lot of common ground with them. Um, uh, people like A.P. Wadsworth, the editor of The Guardian, were, were hoped for a sort of Labour government with a with a liberal um, uh, uh, supportive element to it. Um, it. It's surprising, therefore, that once you get into the first period that I'll describe, the, the post-war period, the period from 45 up to about 59, the liberals are, are accused by Meghan Lloyd George of drifting to the right. They're accused of, of having abandoned the radical tradition. Um, but most of the, the impression, uh, the, the, or most of the evidence that gave that impression was based on parliamentary behaviour. It was based on how Liberal MPs voted. Uh, and it is true that Liberal MPs, the, the tiny number of uh, it, it, heroically stubborn figures who managed to stay in Parliament during that period, did support um, Churchill's government and uh, uh, Eden's and Macmillan's government up to 1959 um, uh, in, in every parliamentary year. In fact, under Attlee, they'd, they'd been pretty um, equivocal. They'd uh, supported Attlee more in, in half of his uh, term of office as prime minister and, and opposed him more in, in the other half of the years. Uh, so this impression of parliamentary behaviour might easily lead people, and it certainly frustrated Meghan Lloyd George, with the idea that um, the, the opportunity to work with Labour was being wasted. And she was talking to Herbert Morrison and trying to build up a relationship with the Labour Party to help feed radical ideas uh, from the Liberal Party into, into the uh, Labour administration. Um, but the problem was, the Labour, and, and always has been, in fact, that the Labour Party is, is, a, is a, a bitterly resistant organisation in terms of cooperation. It, uh, I, one has to only think of the, the 2010 uh, coalition um, negotiations, which were described by Diane Abbott, Diane Abbott as being a, a return to 1931. And you think, well, the circumstances are so different. And, the, and the, the figures involved are so different that it, it, it's simply um, evidence of a, 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 a kind of um, disposition towards fear of betrayal uh, that, that the Labour Party suffers from. And it felt it had no need to work with the Liberal Party. That's not to say the Liberal Party wasn't developing ideas during that period and certainly in the period shortly after it. Um, even though the, the, what we call the Grimmond era or the realignment era, perhaps more, more accurately, since Grimmond was really continuing, uh, his leadership was continuing the same pattern in Parliament as, as uh, uh, Clement Davis had for the first couple of years. After 1959, after the Labour's third defeat, um, and after a new generation of people had come into the Liberal Party, um, to support Grimmond uh, and to respond to his idea of realignment, then there were some genuine discussions about the possibility of supporting a Labour government. But once again, uh, Labour under Wilson, ironically a former president of the Oxford University Liberal Club, um, uh, resisted cooperation. Um, however, the ideas produced by the New Orbits Group, by Grimmond himself, by his advisors, uh, in the books he wrote, in the, in the relentless series of articles in, in Liberal News that produced new policy ideas, they, they uh, became a seedbed of some, only some of these ideas, uh, um, uh, priorities for the future. Um, it was then in the next era, if you like, of... Um, 
uh, uh, of what, what Chris Cook calls pacts and alliances, where where liberals actually began to uh, take part in government or support governments in the Lib Lab pact, uh, and then working with another party in the alliance. Um, the, the, the problem occurred of having the ability to develop and test by stronger representation in local government, particularly radical ideas, ideas about uh, local control of policy, about um, consultation, about, about the environment. Interestingly, the Liberal Party was the first in 1979 to really focus in the manifesto uh, on uh, environmental policy uh, of the three main parties. Um, and uh, so even a period like the Grimmond era in which you know, parliamentary representation didn't grow, um, ideas did grow. Uh, and some of those filtered through to what Liberal Democrats were able to do later. In that last period, the, the Liberal Democrat era, uh, um, from uh, 1988 onwards, or perhaps being more accurate from 1992 onwards, when the, the project started with Paddy Ashdown's speech at Chard, um, you began to see an agenda pulling together some of the priorities that had developed over the post-war period, which eventually did seep in some parts into the Blair government's agenda. We did finally get devolution, which the, the radical reform, which uh, everyone from Gladstone had been arguing for. Um, the, the, the European project, of course, had developed. Um, and we got a certain amount of constitutional reform within Britain in terms of the Human Rights Act, um, a, a rather weakened uh, Freedom of Information uh, Act, uh, and um, then finally, uh, a limited use of proportional representation. Um, all of these and the Lib Lab Pact in its own way brought issues to the table, made radicalism or some radical ideas worthy of discussion, made them part of public discourse in a way that liberals in the 1950s couldn't possibly have hoped for and couldn't dare to do because let's face it, there were only five Liberal MPs at one point and only one of them faced an opponent from the Conservatives. Now there are limits to what a party can do in those circumstances if it wishes to maintain a, a parliamentary existence. Um, the, the very last stage of the Liberal Democrats' existence, the coalition, is the one that one might think is the least uh, promising for radicals. Uh, 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 an arrangement with the Conservatives, of course, left very little scope for introducing radical policies, especially in an era of austerity um, and uh, facing, a, you know, working with a party that's significantly larger. Um, so uh, it, it was, it, we have to look carefully for the, the, the uh, ideas that were able to be implemented there. Uh, we did have an expansion of, of um, uh, apprenticeships. We did have the pupil premium. We did have the tax reform, which again had been argued for uh, by Grimman for many years uh, to take a large number of people out of taxation, out of income tax, out of direct taxation, um, who, who had been, who'd crept into it over the course of the, the consensus years of the, the main parties. Um, but what the whole of this narrative indicates to me is that there, it, it, being out of office doesn't mean you're unable to come up with ideas. In fact, sometimes it means you're able to come up with a great welter of ideas uh, that, that being an office uh, or even seeking office too obsessively um, uh, inhibits you from doing. Um, it's the development of those ideas and their implementation, even possibly by other parties or uh, at other levels of government than, than at the national level. Uh, that's important. And um, in order to, to, to do that effectively, there's a number of circumstances that have to come about. Firstly, the party has to decide, its members and its leaders and its voters have to be in favour of radical liberalism. So, you know, beverage in 1945, or the fact that, you know, around the time of the Chard speech, um, we saw for the first time most Liberal Democrat voters became Liberal Democrat second preference Labour voters. It allowed a leadership that wants to go in that direction to be more progressive. Um, so the party has to be in the right frame of mind. The the the, uh, 
the discourse, the agenda of of public affairs has to be uh, in the right manner. You know, after 18 years of Conservative government, people were ready for um, constitutional reform. Uh, right at the moment, it's quite difficult to generate interest in it. Um, you have to have uh, a, a opinion directed at the right issues. It's very interesting that um, if you look at party uh, election addresses or um, uh, the uh, the uh, conference ballot, the assembly ballots amongst uh, local associations for um, uh, for the the uh, agenda at uh, the upcoming assembly. Actually, constitutional reforms hardly ever the, the top issue. It's almost always the economy. When you look at parliamentary interventions, the MPs are mainly contributing about foreign affairs. Um, so we that's because there was an attempt to to um appeal to what was on the public's mind and the public agenda public discourse has to be right and the other thing is the other parties have to be right as well they have to be willing to to work blair was willing to work obviously for his own reasons with the liberal party churchill tried uh, but at too high a price um the Labour Party often has not wanted to. And of course, those parties have got to leave enough space between them for the Liberals to say something distinctive. They've got to leave the Liberals with room for their agenda. So they've got to be cooperative, but different from the Liberal Party. There's got to be a friendly electorate and there's got to be a party determined to go in that direction. And if, if I look back at the things radical liberalism has raised in the past, and I think what, what might be right for now? You know, employment is going to be the issue of the next few years. The, how we work with what they used to call automation. The Liberal Party in the 1950s had a, a, a real priority in trying to think about what you do with the advance of technology and how you make things work, and how you make work for people operate in such a way as to make their lives better. All of those things are going to be a major challenge over the next few years. And maybe that's where Radical liberalism can bring a new idea in. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Thank you both. Now, I don't think we're short of people in the party with radical ideas. I think the visions are there. But you've posed some really interesting questions about the difference between then and now in terms of how we deliver. And, and I'm going to take um, I'm going to abuse my position as chair to ask a couple of questions first, and then we've got, got some interesting questions beginning to come in. And Meg, Thomas, you'll be next in line. But first of all, you talked about the idea that the party has to be in the right frame of mind for a radical vision, united vision. So how do we get it in the right frame of mind? What can we learn from, from the way it was done before? How do they align people? And don't say it was just one visionary person because that's tricky. Uh, shall I go? Shall I go first? I I, I really don't want to try to um, give professional advice to political leaders. Um, uh, I'd, I'd be the last person anyone would, anyone would want to do that. But um, actually, I think I mean. It is interesting you say individual visionary people aren't, aren't the, the, certainly can't be the sole reason and, and can't ever really be the fundamental reason that you change a party's direction. Um, there's a number of ways, and, and interesting, let's, I mean, uh, the reason, the way in which a leader can be important is the leader can analyze and work out what their own particular approach is. Grimmond, when he took over the Liberal Party, he, he said quite openly, wrote in one of his books, I think it, it is, says that a lot of people who are liberals aren't really bothered about changing things. A lot of people who vote liberal just like quite like things the way they are and, and see themselves as moderate. He says, now that's wrong. They, those people shouldn't really be voting liberal. Other people should be voting liberal. And the, all those people should be persuaded of, of radical liberal policies. Um, and so, you know, leaders clearly do have a role, but what look at the look at how the Labour Party has changed recently. Changing a party isn't always good, but um, you know, uh, but you can have a change in membership. You can recruit a lot of new members. Grimman did that. That was one of the reasons he was able to shift the the balance of priorities in the party. Sometimes events help you do it. I mean, in a curious way, Suez helped Grimman um, sort of 
give give political shock treatment to to some people. You can have a change of um, of uh, culture and attitudes in, between generations. You can be on the the cusp of a change in generational opinions. As we well know we are now. There's a number of um, cultural and political questions that are obviously dividing uh, generations from each other. Um, so sometimes it's a question. Yes, it's not the leader. It's the person spotting the wave and being in the in the right depth of water, uh, but the leader still got to get on the surfboard. Michael. Unblock, uh, unmute yourself, please. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, that's it. No, you've muted yourself again. There we are. Uh, to save me being heard heckling Matt, that was what it was. <laughs> the, um, Matt's quite right. You can go ahead of public opinion, but, but not too far. And I think the, the, the job of uh, the political leaders, and I say that in the widest sense, not just the leader, is to analyse the public mind and to see how you can pick up that and run with it. Take, for instance, the public is often ahead of its own prejudices. For instance, I think the public now accepts very difficult measures to do with climate change. To be told that you will not be able to buy a petrol or diesel car in the near future is astonishing. But I don't think there's any opposition to that as far as I can make out. The same sex marriage bill now, I think, would be accepted by virtually everybody in the country. I don't think there's any great opposition to it. I mean, take a minor one, smoking in public places, that was very heavily contested, but now is accepted and it was ahead of public opinion at its time. And I think it's crucial to, to see how you actually gain acceptance for things. I've always been very impressed by a, a little book written by Lord Devlin, Patrick Devlin, the great judge. And he wrote a book called The Enforcement of Morals. And there's a chapter on democracy and morals. And he compares the elections and the electorate to a giant jury. He says, look, he says, juries, they're not reactionary. They don't go for their prejudices. They hear the case put in front of them. The argument is presented on both sides. They act corporately as a group of 12, and what they decide happens. He said, if the politicians treat the public in the same way as a giant jury, he said, my belief is they will get the same considered answer. The public may not like what they're deciding, but the right thinking view may well prevail. And if I just quickly say that post-pandemic politics are absolutely in the liberal camp, when you look at and try to analyze again this whole question of opinion what are the the factors that go into post-pandemic politics firstly it's solidarity between citizens locally and nat naturally secondly the importance of community has now been emphasized greatly third the enhanced status of the public service something the Tories never liked in the past but they've now been forced to accept fourthly the acknowledgement of the key role of the nhs again absolutely accepted now Fifth, an increased awareness of human values over economic values. The economic values have been clobbered in this past year, but human values have come to the fore. Sixth is Keynes in economics now are, are accepted and throwing money at things. The, the magic money tree exists. And lastly, the whole issue of job creation and of cooperatives and common ownership. Now, these are absolutely in our camp. These are not labor issues as such. But are we picking up this one and running with it? Not. And it's because we don't p profess a, a vision of what the liberal society is like. There's been no statement of liberal democrat values or of principles since 2002, 19 years ago. So it's all right, we can do all the policy and there's these 154 line motions come to the spring conference. But that's not the point. Unless they are built into a view of society and a vision, they really are built on sand. And that's where we have to go. It has to have a vision which people will sacrifice, family, money and so on for and go towards that end. And it's right in our camp at the moment if we actually pick up these issues and run with them. Thank you both. I'm now going to, on Meg's behalf, um, Meg Thomas's behalf. She asked Michael in particular, so how do we get out of the doldrums? Well, it, it's what we've just said in, in many ways. I think firstly is to, to work on a 
statement of principles and values, which is this is what we actually are founded on. This is what we see, and this is the kind of society we want. It's the job of the politician to show what kind of society it would be with liberal influence on it. And then to pick up these issues which have come to the fore in the, in the pandemic, and which have very much, I think, united right thinking opinion. And also to pick up on what, in, what, what Quakers call right, the, the, the sincere friends of freedom. And it's not everybody who's an instinctive liberal, but there are those people in the community who are liberals who don't necessarily know it. And I say, I'm, I'm alarmed by the fact that it is writers such as Ian Dunt or Tim Garth Nash or uh, uh, others who are doing the, the liberal job for the party. There are writers around who we ought to be drawing in. I, mean, I read The Observer every, every Sunday. There are two writers there who write liberalism every Sunday. One is a woman called Barbara Ellen. It's a terrific column every Sunday. I don't know whether you realise it, but Charles Moore's brother, son of Richard Moore, Rowan Moore, who is the architectural correspondent for The Observer, he's another one who writes liberal values and acknowledges himself as a liberal. We're not, we're not drawing these people in. What Grimman was terrific at was drawing in these sincere friends of freedom, not members of the party necessarily. And there was a whole series of booklets came out in the 60s, which Joe inspired, which had on the group that produced them, people who were not card carrying members, but were sympathetic. And they were very well accepted and very well prepared. The, other, the only other thing to say is that you have to have the organization right as well. See another name from post 1945 liberalism, not remember much today is Frank Byers. Byers was a terrific organizer and a great politician. And in a general election, Frank was in, would be in charge, and very much so. He was sort of, sort of cooperative. He would ring around and say, Michael, I want you in the office now. I mean, and he assembled a group of staff and he would say, right, this is the problem today. What do you think? We'd tell him what we thought. We'd all then go out and he'd make a decision. Now that's the sort of organization you need and, and a person on top of it. But without the basis for it, the rock on which these things stand, then it is, I'm afraid, all just castles in the air. Shimmering they may be, but castles nonetheless. There has to be a real now, foundation. I'm really pleased we've got a lot of questions coming in around what we mean by radicalism, which is at the core of what we're talking about. Um, and Keith, Keith Sutherland starts by saying, well, look, we have actually lots of radical ideas and, and Matt and Michael have been giving us a lot of them. But we often seem to be banging on about lots of worthy issues, which frankly, people aren't interested in. How do we capture the public's imagination and match what we're saying to something that might resonate? I, I, well, I mean, I, I, Thank you, Michael. Um, I mean, I would say, that, you know, we're dealing with two questions here. The question about being in the doldrums touches on this as well, because, you know, do we mean being in the doldrums in terms of ideas or do we mean being in the doldrums in the polls? And they're two different questions and that they, they get answered at two different times. The ideas question has to come first and it has to come, it, you know, it may come slowly and it may come during, you know, you look at the 1950s and 60s and even the 70s, you know, the 60s were a period of great intellectual ferment in uh, the Liberal Party, much of which bore fruit later, but the parliamentary representation during that period was very poor. Uh, so you don't, you, you may think to yourself, you know, are we, are we d doing the right thinking at the moment, even if, the, if we're not, you know, in ministerial limousines? Um, and and th those ideas um, have to come themselves by stealth. The, the public are rightly suspicious of big ideas announced or names of ideas which have no substance. You know, the big society, the third way. Um, um, I'm not even sure if the current prime minister has come out with a with a, with a, with a slogan, but um, um, but uh, the, you know the the name of a big philosophy without something that people can see as its substance something that's been uh, piloted in local government that's been uh, that's been put out into the public consciousness for a time um where they can think yeah i know what that is and i now see how it works as part of a more general liberal philosophy uh, but yeah one of the one of the ways to get out of the doldrums is to is to do it at the right pace the problem with that though in my view, is that it is tinkering with the edges 
and with two other philosophies which are dangerous and unhelpful to society. And I, what I'm concerned about is actually being able to determine the, the heights of policy rather than the tinkering with a few ideas which are adopted elsewhere. Um, and we know full well what the, the Tory party is like. It's, I mean, John Pardo once said that uh, a hatred of the Tory party is the beginning of political wisdom. So we know, we know that. But the Labour Party is equally dangerous because it's a hegemonic party. It believes in control. It doesn't want to share power. It doesn't believe in pluralism either. It doesn't like the voluntary sector unless it's controlling its grant policy and so on and so forth. So that's also a dangerous philosophy. And the curious thing is that liberalism is the, the most generous philosophy ever known. That was a, a, a quote from Ortega de Gasset in 1930, marvellous passage. He says that, and we have therefore to do things differently. What amazes me always is the lack of faith that liberals have in their own philosophy. That, that's always puzzles me. For instance, take some issues which are absolutely ours and nobody else's, which we've held for a long time, and yet we don't push them forward. One, of course, is the land value taxation. When people talk about increases in house prices, there's no such thing. It's increase in land. Bricks and mortar don't increase in value. And there are also all sorts of social values come out of land value taxation. And it's been Liberal Party policy since 1893. We don't say today, oh no, we know, it's, it's, it's the past. The, the, the idea of worker cooperatives is entirely ours. Neither Labour nor Tories like the idea because they prefer the two sides of industry. I, I recollect one time Joe Grimm was speaking at a campaign meeting in the Cone Valley and a well-known socialist at the back of the hall dying to ask a question and he said, Mr Grimman, Mr Grimman, what are you going to do for the working class? And Joe got up and he said, I'm going to abolish it. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? We're going to have cooperatives. We don't. We're not going to look at it in terms of class warfare. And the, the other th interesting thing too is liberals' internationalism is being practiced today by largely the faith communities. Where are the people who are looking after asylum seekers and refugees? Today? It's the faith communities, and the ones that they are actually looking after, they are campaigning for them, not just uh, helping them socially. And yet we're not picking up on that and saying, here is a whole community who are liberal and they need to have changed the policy rather than have you looking after it at the back of it. And this was the whole basis of people like Roundtree and Cadbury. They were not just interested in ameliorating the effects. They were interested in changing the causes that brought these problems about. So that's what radicalism means to my mind. You are changing the basis of how we see okay, society. Can that sort of answer some of what Alessandra <laughs> has been asking, Alessandra Rossetti has been saying, well, what is radical today? And what is the level of radicalism that we should, that we would feel comfortable with, that, that, that is what we want to say about the world? And is radicalism about a set of policies or an approach? And does that in approach include working with other people? So there's a whole package of questions there about when we say the radical tradition and the radical future, what do we mean by that? Well, I've never been afraid of working with other people. I've never been afraid of sharing a platform with most most horrible people. Uh, you know, I, th this idea of no platforming and so on is crazy to my mind. Unless you can combat the arguments, you will never get anywhere in politics. If you take Macron in France, Macron has a lot of faults. Partly, he's not a politician, it's one of the problems. But in debating with Marine Le Pen at the last presidential election, he demolished her. She was like a goldfish in us mouthing these comments. And Macron said, what does that mean? And taking it on. And that has to be done. You should never be frightened of debating and tackling these issues. So yes, you cooperate. Yes, you, you, you work with other people. And for instance, I, even though I've, I've always been in a minority in either city council or parliament, whatever, I've never felt impotent politically because I've got things done that I wanted through all sorts of tactics and uh, sometimes underhand means at times and getting things through. But it's possible to do that. And I think one of the things, of course, is to be good natured as well about this. I have no time at all for these nasty, vicious socialists, particularly in Tories also. Nor should you just write things off. I mean, for instance, Northern Ireland was just written off by the Tories to win the referendum. There was no solution to the problem of, of Northern Ireland and its curious status. And yet, despite the, the Good Friday Agreement, the Tories wrote Ireland off. They were absolutely expendable. And now, of course, it's bouncing back on them. 
the Ulster Unionists, they now got what they didn't expect, I mean, voted for Brexit. There is no solution to it. You have a land border on the island of Ireland with all the problems of the EU there, or you're all in the European Union at all. There's nothing in between. And that you have to be able to explain and do that. The, the, the need to explain is always there in politics. And pluralism is an absolutely fundamental liberal value. The end does not justify the means. You have to, although sometimes the, the means make the end very sour and, and bitter. And so you have to work carefully and that means cooperating Matt, with people. Yeah, I mean, uh, radicals are, you know, because from the very start of the party, they have been, you know, self-announced radicals have usually been people in the minority in the party and in society. Um, you know, but radical is a political word, and most people don't see themselves as as kind of uh, self-conscious political thinkers. They might share a lot of the opinions, they might have enthusiasm for a lot of the ideas, but um, radicalism means a lot of different things to different people, and it, it, you know, is the um, is the kind of uh, label that relatively few people might attach to themselves. However, that therefore means you know. Uh, radicals believe have to believe in working with other people. Then you know you get to make a virtue out of necessity to some extent. Uh, the Liberal Party since the Second World War has not been in a position to to impose its policies on other people. But philosophically, uh, radicalism and it shouldn't want to. They should want to celebrate um, the, the 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 sovereignty of the rational individual. They should want to let people make their own decisions, build their own communities, uh, uh, choose their own way of life. And there has been some success in doing that and in supporting that approach, as Michael says, without necessarily being in office. I mean, if you said that a party be that between 1945 and 2010 was never in office and yet managed to get Britain into, or managed to see Britain into the European Union, the introduction of devolution, the use of proportional representation in some parts of the country, the introduction of the Human Rights Act. Um, you know, I, I think a, a liberal in 1950, looking at that set of achievements, will go, hmm, it's not bad. You know, how many MPs did we have? Oh, well, maximum 62. Um, and, and they might even say, looking at the subsequent years after we did uh, join office and say, well, curiously, there was less achieved in that short period of time than, than there was in the longer period of time before. I've got. I've just got one, one further comment just on that, and that's that one of the things about uh, Grimm and, and other liberal leaders at the time was that they had a certain amount of influence through the size of the liberal vote. It was not just the number of MPs, and we have rather abandoned that today. And when we now the task is how do you get five percent to save your deposit? Which is absolutely, you know, drives me mad this little thing, you have to have a big core vote of people who are voting Liberal because they believe that that's what they want to see. And that gives you far more influence. It's the combination. And unless Labour and Tory MPs feel threatened by Liberal candidates, then they won't take any notice so, of Liberal I think we're all clear that this is about moving on from being more efficient managerialists of the local council than Tories or Labour. Will be. It's about it's about something fundamental to who we are and how we see the world. I want in the last ten minutes, nine minutes, to try and squeeze in three questions. So I'm going to have to ask for really short answers. Big questions. Firstly, <laughs> Beverage et al. didn't have to deal with social media. How do we d debate properly and get new ideas explored and tested constructively in the internet age? Okay, we're taking these one at a time, or do you want to yeah. give us all three? Try that one. Uh, I think there should be more public platforms for uh, uh, publicly accountable and visible debate. I do think people who contribute to social media should be accountable for their opinions. I mean, the, the corollary of the view Michael quite rightly gives that we, no, no platform is a, is a, a you know, a, an acknowledgement of your own failure in some ways. Uh, those are the people you're debating with. You have to know who they are. They they should have the they they should have the both the, the courage and the accountability to to say who they are. So maybe uh, some public investment in creating a, a structure and certain amount of regulation about 
who people are, not what they say, would um, would make it a, a, a more informed platform to use. Michael. I have a, a view which is probably not widely held that social media will reduce in influence over a period of time. I think it, these things are cyclical. I think it's a problem of what Marshall McLuhan was saying, that the medium is the message. And the immediacy of social media is its danger. I mean, I've had to curb myself from instant replies to emails even, because you'll say things immediately that are not a considered view and you'll regret later. And that's even worse with, with social media. And I think, as I say, I think it will it will eventually decline in influence. And I think it's partly that it reflects the state of politics, actually, that there is no respect for politics or politicians today. It's a terrible situation. And that will have to change. And it will have to change generally. And we ought to be in the forefront of saying that. Otherwise, I don't think there will be any attempt to have a dialogue. And dialogue, is, as Matt says, is the only real way to debate issues and have them tested. Can I ask you two final linked questions? One is from Penny Lewis, who asks, is there a difference between being a radical and being progressive? And that well-known contributor, Anonymous, has asked, how do we turn members into radicals? And those seem linked questions. Uh, I think the second question comes back to my view about the need for a vision which people will campaign and sacrifice for. They're not going to sacrifice in the way that we many of us have done over the years, which is why we have huge overdrafts and sometimes family just you know broken up and the rest of it. it on policy, policy does not really affect people, nor do really, fr frankly, neither does campaign campaigning. The number of people who came who became active over a period of time through campaigning, in my experience, is very, very small. They'll stay for the period of that campaign and then they, they, they go. They're not the, there isn't the commitment. They only stay and, and embed themselves for a, for a real long haul to the future if they are imbued with the spirit of liberalism that they are taught, taught if you like, or uh, assimilate it from us what it's all about and then we'll see the need for that different society and different vision and that will then bring you the commitment towards the future. In terms of radical and progressive, I'm, weird. I'm not so keen on the terms anyway. As Matt said before, the, the, when the Liberal Party was formed, the Radical Party was part of it. It was a faction within it, if you like, and over a period of time that became less and less important. But even still, after the war, there were those who called themselves part of the Radical Party. I, I knew some in, in Yorkshire, but that has now gone as a, as a part of it because the social circumstances have changed. And so radical and progressive, wow, it, it, it's all liberal, really. For instance, I was never all that bothered about the economic liberals in the party. They were always there. They debate their corner, party assembly and the like. But it was always a small minority and they're always lost in debate. The same with the, the Atlanticists, I remember at Assembly, a woman called Elmer Dangerfield was one of the great things. And she made the terrible mistake with liberals of asking rhetorical questions. Do you really want a united Europe? And yes, came the reply. Do you want therefore to minimize our links across the Atlantic? Yes. And every question she asked got an even more resounding reply she didn't want. But the, the, the people who had those views were in the minority. And, and it's a part of the process of debate. And I think we have to do it and we have to do it amongst ourselves. But it's the basis on which we do these things, Thank not you. the Matt, actual details. Quick... Very quickly, um, yeah, despite what I said about, you know, the granular implementation of policy and the stealth introduction of it, uh, um, Michael is right that in the end, it has to be part of a big idea, a set of principles that people believe in. You only have, you know, look at the people that took us out of Europe. They presented a big idea. Now, wasn't a particularly useful or, 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 or indeed accurate one, but um, it was it was the principle that people believed they were voting for that caused them to go out and vote. It was not uh, not really the details of policy. Um, the difference between um, uh, progressive and radical, I'd, I'd like to just say, it's, it's a question of timing. Uh, progressive 
means you're there, there have been progressive parties interestingly on the london county council that that involved uh the the the, the webs and the fabian movement there were others on coventry county council that were run by the tories so progressive has an even more but more flexible meaning than, than radical but i would guess radicals just want to do things a bit quicker thank you both very much what, what we hope we've achieved in in, in this um fringe meeting is is to understand it's not about going back to where we were we're not about this is not about reinventing beverage because as matt said the world's different now but what heartens me and i know many other radicals is the scale and the integration of the vision that beverage represents it didn't pick off bits we had loads of individual policies they had a big picture of the world they wanted to inhabit and both Michael and, and Matt have stressed how important it is for us to encourage ideas to grow. This is the time for the thinking space and articulating the vision. I think what we're all saying in this workshop is that we want a clear vision for the future that makes us want to march towards the sound of gunfire, not shed loads of detailed policy, but something that gets us in our hearts and gets us out on the streets and gets us actually convincing people that there is a better way to run the world that they'll buy into. And I want to thank, on behalf of everybody who's been here, I want to thank Michael and Matt for sending me out tonight feeling a bit more motivated and actually have the conversation and get there. And I want to thank Andy for looking after us. And I want to thank you for coming. And I hope whatever else you're doing at conference this weekend and during the election campaign, I hope you end up more motivated to do more to make the difference. Thank you very much for coming and joining us this evening. And thank you, Michael and Matt.